All right. So um, my name is Barry Jones. Uh, you all already met me a little bit earlier. I am a fractional CTO consultant with Brightfall. Um, I've been a software developer for 24 years. About seven years ago, I pivoted towards uh, trying to help developers' lives suck less. Um, and that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Um, I also like to say that uh, I am constantly at war with the Scrum Industrial Complex, and uh, we are going to take it down one day. Now, <clears throat> buckle in. I have 57 slides to get through in 15 minutes, so this is going to be pretty fast-paced. All right, so what exactly is a story point? I'm going to read this. According to Atlassian, Story points are units of measure expressing an estimate of the overall effort required to fully implement a product backlog item or any other piece of work. Teams assign story points relative to work complexity, the amount of work, and risk or uncertainty. So we already have multiple competing, competing definitions here. Effort, complexity, risk, uncertainty, amount of work. Um, in practice, most people would say that it is a relative measure of complexity generated with some type of Fibonacci sequence, typically. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 20, or 21. 20 would be proper, or 21 would be proper, 20 is for Scrum, because Scrum. So, but these are supposed to be relative estimates, relative to the other stories that have been estimated by this specific team only to this specific team. That gets lost in translations a lot. So story point estimates are gonna be different from team to team. Meaning that, you know, team A over here could have a story that's five points. Team B could estimate the exact same story as a 20 point story because it's a measure relative to how they're estimating everything else and how they're estimating things within their teams. So naturally, what should we do when we know that estimates with story points are different across every team? Yes, we should compare teams based on the amount of story points that they complete. <sighs> but that will never ever happen, right? No, never. No matter how many times they say it in the scrum meetings or trainings or no matter how many times people are told that it's just within the team, somehow that always escapes. So why do story points get wider at the top? The Fibonacci sequence is, it comes from a good place. It's supposed to be trying to build in variability at the higher rates. So one is essentially a very precise estimate. Uh, two is kind of precise, but it's close. A 21 is really somewhere from like a 14 to a 50. A 13 is like an eight to a 19. The higher you go, you're actually giving a range, not an actual number. And a fun thing is that you can't add a number in a range. 26 one-point stories is a very accurate measure. Two 13-point stories is somewhere from here to here because you're building in a lot of uncertainty with the estimate. And so, knowing that points are less precise, what should we do at the top? Knowing that points are, larger points are less precise, what should we do? Yes, we're gonna add them all up and we're going to pretend that the sum accurately reflects the total amount of work. Again, that would be silly. So let's talk about velocity. Velocity is what you do when you add all the points together and assume it predicts the future. This is built into every single agile methodology that's out there. This measurement is completely broken. That's why your lives are hell. Is this is the root cause of all of your problems. You're adding an, uh, a precise number to a range and you can't do that. That doesn't work mathematically. None of your estimates are gonna make sense that way. But everything that we build around from these various agile methodologies are based on it, unfortunately. So, as we know, if you need to increase your velocity, you could just say all my one-point stories are actually two-point stories now, and boom, you have doubled your velocity. See? That's all you gotta do, because it's a completely nonsense metric. It's easy to game if you want to. This, this you know, violates Goodhart's law, of course. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. Have you ever been in an environment where somebody said, you have to complete this many points per week or points per iteration or sprint or whatever? You go, okay, I'll double my points. Boom, nailed it, love it. So, I mean, when we're talking about complexity, I always use a Rubik's Cube to describe this. You can give a Rubik's Cube to a group of people and somebody might know how to solve this thing within 15 seconds like a pro. Other people might be able to like, look at it, work on it for a month at a time and never figure it out. You might agree that it has a complexity estimate of five. That doesn't mean anything, though. 
because it all depends on who actually works on it. <laughs> and so ultimately, points aren't time, though. That was not one of our multiple competing definitions. Points are, and they're, they, they're explicitly listed as not time when they're in, the, in some of the other definitions. So if we know that points aren't time and are highly va variable, what exactly should we do next? Yes, we should set up deadlines and then tell our customers about them. That ever happened to anybody? Anybody? Yes, exactly. Uh, and inevitably what happens when you start giving deadlines based on inaccurate estimates, you're going to miss those and everybody's going to look stupid for it in the end. But that would never happen. So back in 2011, uh, Scrum actually tried to fix this. In your, in your sprints, if you're in an environment where they're still doing sprint commitments, they're wrong. They've been wrong for 13 years. Scrum changed it from commitment to forecast back in 2011 because language matters. And when you say commitment, people think it means I'm going to do exactly this, this two-week period. It's forecast because you're actually just trying to get a good prediction of where you are, which is a very big difference. The creator of story points, Ron Jeffries, actually disavowed them. He wrote an entire story points revisited blog post. I highly recommend you read it, but the big takeaways are I, miss, uh, I certainly deploy their misuse. Using them to predict when will be done is a weak idea. Tracking how actuals compare with estimates is at best wasteful. And comparing teams based on quality of estimates or velocity is actively harmful. So, but people asking for estimates do care about time. So one way or another, points are always going to get converted to, to time some way. And this is reasonable. I know, you gotta take a step back. You felt like I was going somewhere else with this, but this is actually reasonable. Business people have to be able to make decisions. They need estimates for about how long something is gonna take or how much effort is going to be involved so that they can make a prediction, uh, so they can make decisions about what their priorities are based on a return on investment type formula. They have an expected value that they're gonna get out of some feature they're developing, and then they have an expected cost. If you take the highest value with the lowest cost and you order things based on that re return on investment, you're always gonna be prioritizing the most bang for your buck, and that is a good way of doing business. So you do still have to be able to project things somehow. Um, now, if you wanna do this, you can always just say, hey, we're gonna get better at estimating. And there's a great book called Software Estimation, Demystifying the Black Art. It shows you how simple estimating is in only about 300 pages. And it tells you how simple those, those practices are by using multiple different estimates and then readjusting as you have new information so you don't actually stick to the estimates in the first place. Um, Estimates are hard. They are. There's no getting around. Points do make them harder. But as long as there's a lot of uncertainty in the process, estimates are always going to be guesses. There is no way of getting around it. So the other thing that you run into, if you've ever been in an environment like this, if you've ever been accosted for missing an estimate because you did too much, raise your hand. Okay. The people who did that are morons. That triggers an absolute race to the bottom because it turns out doing more than you're projected to do is the only actual way to raise your velocity. That's math. So they're incentivizing you to lowball to hit your estimate exactly right. And if you, if you get lower than you're projecting, you're, you're costed for that too. So you, unless you nail it exactly, somebody's going to get mad at you which just incentivizes you to overestimate everything you do so that you know you can hit it exactly on the nose as the overlords are trying to get you to do, which is not helpful for anybody. It, I mean, you, you all want to be shooting for the moon. It brings everybody up. A bad system will beat a good person every time. This is one of the greatest quotes of all time when it comes to management science. So um, in, lean, in a lean philosophy, one of the key elements that you look for is that you're constantly trying to remove waste from the system. It's just, it's just an aspect of continuous improvement. What are we spending time on that is not helpful? How can we make this more efficient? Uh, how much time do you spend doing story point estimates? Knowing now that these are completely useless. They offer no benefit whatsoever. I've seen teams spend, this says 30 minutes, really an hour and a half. I've literally sat in a meeting and watched the team go for an hour and a half arguing whether a story was a three point or a five point. And after that, capturing not one detail of why they rationalized it one way or the other. But they cared so much about getting the estimate exactly right because they had had so much pressure for that, it just caused the entire implosion of all the planning process. None of that is constructive. You can project both time and cost without doing any of this stuff. Um, so Dan Milston says, uh, in the presence of uncertainty, acquiring information is often the best way to generate value. I completely agree with this. In most agile environments, you've heard this called a spike, essentially when you're doing exploratory work to see what's coming, uh, 
what's coming. Donald Reinertsen wrote this wonderful book called The Principles of Product Development Flow. It's basically the Bible of product development. It has all of the math, economics, and absolute proved scientific truth that you need. If you've been in a crappy environment and you read this book, you'll be fist pumping, go, yes, I told you that, and there's the proof the entire time. That's what I did, you know, teach their own. Um, scaled Agile framework is actually about 70% based on this book. I know a lot of people have had bad experiences with Scaled Agile. I've read those experiences. It's one of those situations where there's a lot of people continuing to just do the same bad things in a different environment. They're trying to move towards best practices, but they still pull in a lot of strong practices, including story points. Scaled Agile actually tells you you don't need it, but that's a different point entirely. Um, the key points in here are all pretty much exactly correct, scientifically proven repeatedly over and over and over. Managing queues is what Reinertsen advocates for, specifically queue length. And when you look at a queue, this is consistent in every environment, even some envir sub environments and sub teams. Essentially, when you are overloaded, when you are 100% utilized, the backlog will then start to grow exponentially because you're aiming for an old manufacturing style environment where you're going for 100% utilization. And the moment that you do that, anything that is off the projection throws everything completely out of whack. And this is actually how bad it gets. This is why you're overwhelmed. Because you're trying to hit things that you shouldn't be trying to hit. You're overcommitted. So how does this look in practice? How does managing queues look in practice? Essentially, you break down the work in smaller tasks. Has anybody here heard of extreme programming? Okay, a few hands. Extreme programming came out in the, in the 90s. It was a book that laid the groundwork for a, lot of, uh, for a lot of future thinking. Turns out it got a bunch of stuff right. And one of the key pieces of it is smaller stories. Um, ideally, just keep breaking things down into smaller steps. Work with your team and actually just step through the process of how would I build this thing step by step. And then capture the total number of steps. You can do it in whatever size makes sense for your team. But if you get to something where we're like, ah, you know, this would actually, I don't really know what's going to be involved in this, then that's uncertainty and you need to figure that out. You might need to go do a prototype. You might need to go explore. Until you can eliminate that uncertainty, none of your estimates matter. I once got a, bought a house where I had a, an inspector come look at the house um, and he said, you know, here's the things that I can see. You might want to have a plumber look at this. You might want to have an electrician look at that. You might want to have an HVAC person look at that. I went, oh, okay, well, that doesn't sound bad. He didn't make it sound that bad. We did it. I didn't get any of that stuff looked at uh, ahead of time. It was a short sale. I didn't have a choice. But still, I didn't get any of the stuff looked at ahead of time. And they were all as bad as they could have possibly been. Um, and uh, I ended up paying four times because I didn't eliminate my uncertainties. And so when uncertainties have been removed, you're, list with, you're left with a list of tasks, issues, stories, whatever you want to call them in your environment. And you just have to count them because a list of tasks is a queue. That's all a queue is. He's you know, using the term to to remain consistent with the scientific me methodology. But a list of tasks is just a queue. A list of stories is a queue. And you know, essentially, if you're breaking down stories and you've got a question or a risk or something that you're uncertain of, you, your estimate is not, is not complete until you've removed the uncertainties. So you go through, you break down stuff, you identify your uncertainties, and then you focus on removing those. And the company cannot use any projection from what you're trying to do until after those uncertainties have been removed from the process. Once you've broken it down and you don't feel like there's any known uncertainties left, that's a projection they can build on. And that is valuable for everyone, regardless of what point estimate you would give it to. That's a constructive piece of effort from your team. And essentially, instead of tracking velocity, you track average task rate. And so if feature A is 250 tasks, feature B is 50 tasks, and the team typically completes about 50 tasks a week historically, one of them is going to take about five weeks, one of them is going to take about one. No one ever has to ask you for an estimate for that, ever, ever. They can sit down and look at the rate. They can look at no, they can look at the at the feature and go, oh, this is what it, about what it's going to take. And they can make their own projections without having to say, can you do this in this amount of time? Yes, because you feel pressured to do it and you want to and you want to prove that you can, because that's what happens. We always think we can do it, but even if you give a two week estimate and your estimate is two full weeks of actual work and it's on the nose, but other interruptions happen that took you uh, that took you away from it, so it actually takes more closer to like a month and a half to get it done. People are still going to think your estimates are bad, even though your estimate was right on the nose, because it's a perception problem. But with this, they don't, because if you're breaking down the work and the task, people can also see what other tasks you were working on during the time, as long as your team is tracking things that way. They can say, okay, well, they did this many tasks for these, but they also had all these other tasks that had to be done all at the same time. So this is why it got thrown off. Maybe we need to keep other stuff off their plate so they can focus. It shifts the conversation to something productive. So Alan Holub 
uh, I didn't find this talk until after I had uh, written the giant blog post and made this presentation, but uh, he has an excellent talk called No Estimates, about a 30 minute talk. Highly recommend you watch it. I'm going to give you a spoiler. At the very end, he breaks up this slide where he overlays three different graphs of projections. One of them is based on a year of actually doing story point estimates and projecting. The other one is just literally counting the number of stories you have. Over the course of a year, the accuracy is 7% different. That's how close the projections are. You're 7% within the same range if you just count the stories and get back all of the time you're wasting doing these ridiculous story point estimates. Hard to believe, huh? But it's been proven again and again and again and again and again. Didn't actually want to watch the talk. Why is it doing that? Okay, so ultimately you can never estimate again if you just focus on breaking down the work, create projections, remove uncertainty from the process. Other benefit is that cues are also leading indicators, meaning that if you are focusing on breaking down work into tasks um, and you estimate something, say that uh, 50 task project was, you know, you got about a week into it, or say the 250, task project, you got about a week into it or so, or a couple weeks into it, and new, new things had come in. You got new information, the scope grew, and all of a sudden now it's 500 tasks. Well, if it's 500 tasks, then you can see right here, this has grown significantly from where you initially projected it. If you're relying on cycle time or velocity, you're not going to know until after the work is already completed. Because how many times when you give a story point estimate, if you realize there's new information, this might be wrong, are you allowed to go and actually change the estimate in the system? It becomes a big political battle because you said, oh, this was the estimate. Now we want to change the estimate. Can we do that? Ultimately, points are confusing and ultimately pointless. So focus on aggressively removing waste from all of your processes and invest time into meaningful effort, meaningful things, meaningful endeavors. Like the 2025 Carolina Code Conference, who we should, where you should definitely go on August 15th and 16th. Lots of details will be coming out about that soon. Call for speakers will be around January or so. And that is it. And also, I'm trying to launch a product called DMARC Star by the end of the year. It's my first solopreneurial effort, so stay tuned for that if you have any interest in DMARC or email stuff. Thank you all.